This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. Welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. And I'm your host, Raghu Marcus. Well, in the last uh, podcast, uh, I talked, I told the story rather that about my father coming to India to meet my brother and I while we were with Maharaji and how Maharaji told me to give him acid and that he had a death trip and his life got completely changed. Um, now, I haven't gotten any mail, emails about um, the use of LSD and what Maharaji thought about it. And uh, I thought I might mention it. Obviously, with Ramdas, uh, you know, and I think I've told this story before, or many of you know how when, just briefly, when Ramdas went to India the first time, Maharaji asked him for the yogi medicine, which was interpreted as acid, and took a bunch of it and nothing happened. And um, and then when we were there, people asked about uh, psychedelics in general and how they related with spiritual life. Did they do something good for you? Were they bad for you? Whatever. So he um, definitively said, it was good in the beginning. It allowed you to have, he called it, allowed you to have darshan of Christ, of God, for a couple of hours, but then you had to leave, or you came down. And um, ultimately, um, it was not necessary uh, except to introduce you, obviously, to the reality beyond our senses um, and the interconnectivity of everything that we are part of. So, And he did say later, he also said that uh, if you're going to do it, do it alone and in a cold place. Although I would think Ramdas uh, would talk about a guide, potentially, if it was uh, the real deal. So I just wanted to mention that um, because I think it is important, uh, uh, especially after all of the experiences many of us have had, both positive and ne negative, around acid. Um, I would hope mostly positive. Um, so this particular lecture talk that uh, I'm going to play shortly of Ram Dass, um, it contains a lot of stories of his uh, experiences in India. And a couple of them are just stories that, that he was told. One about uh, Ramana Maharshi, the great saint, and of course a couple about uh, Maharaji. And he, and he again tells his story about how he went over to India the first time, what was in his head about it. And and it had to do similarly with what I just mentioned about acid. You know, it was good for him. He took, you know, a ton of trips with Leary and by himself. And uh, eventually he, though, realized that he it could not sustain uh, the experience. And and it just he just didn't have what he called the map. And that's why he went to India. And he, he also said that he went there to... to uh, experience a stretched consciousness, he called it, or to stretch his own consciousness um, and learn how to live on many planes of consciousness simultaneously in those planes that he experienced uh, taking the psychedelics. So he talks about that. And uh, the other thing that's interesting and in my own experience um, you know, we went over there. We were very naive. We had, you know, it was a matter of finding out, as Ramdas mentions, whether or not the laws of the universe work the way you think they do. And certainly with Maharaji um, showing us through miraculous events or miraculous knowing what's called in India, uh, a knower of all hearts, the, a, a finished realized being. One of the uh, definitions of that in India is called antarayami, which means knower of all hearts. It's somebody who knows your past, present, and future. And of course, Maharaja used to demonstrate that you know, all the time. Um, 
there's one story that Ram Dass tells, and I won't detail it out, but it illustrates um, probably the highest form of these kinds of miracles and that completely change your concept of how the universe does work. Um, and in this case, it's a story of him being going to a barber to get a shave, and the barber was an old man, and he was complaining to Maharaji that his eldest son had uh, r taken off 10 years previously, and uh, he needed him. He said, Baba, I need my son. I'm getting old. I need someone to help support the family, and I, I don't know what to do. What should I do? Uh, and the, his face was half-shaved. He had shaving cream on one side still, and he said, well, wait a minute. I got to go pee. So he goes out in the back of the building, and he's there for a few minutes peeing, and he comes back in, and um, they finish the shave, and he says, God will take care. Next day, the guy's son shows up, and his father says, what are you doing here? How did, what happened? He said, I don't even know what I'm doing here. I was, you know, he was somewhere hundreds of miles away or, or whatever, and he said, somebody, you know, came rushing in to this place where I was at and said, and insisted, I needed to go see you immediately. And the funny thing was, he had half, half his face was not shaved and he had shaving cream on it. <laughs> so... As Ramdas says in this uh, lecture that you talk that you listen to, does your world include that possibility? So our worlds did not include that possibility when we went to India, absolutely not. I mean that was storybook stuff, and but these kinds of things happened on a day to day basis, and they were all intended to absolutely um, curtail the thought that you were only your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your senses, and that just stopped in its tracks when you realized there was something else. Now, that is, of course, what many of us got when we first ingested psychedelics. We've got a bit of that potential reality, just a little bit. Now, the other thing, one of the other stories... Um, which is another demonstration of what we think is, you know, we are using our minds and uh, and, and so on to make decisions. Uh, there's a very famous story, and, and again, I'm not going to detail it, but I just want to point it out that uh, Ramdas and a bunch of people were at a meditation course, and they took off. Uh, Ramdas wanted to get out of there. They had done, you know, like maybe a couple of months of, of this intense sitting practice, and the, he wanted to go get some ice cream and relax in a bath in Delhi. And a bunch of people said, okay, we'll come with you because he had a friend with a, bu a school bus kind of deal. And off they went, and they had to go through or bypass this city called Allahabad, which has a big. Um, uh, it's the confluence of the Ganges and the Yamuna and the Saraswati, and there's a big parade ground that maybe is not the right word, uh, but where there's huge gatherings where sadhus come and uh, mendicants, and I'm talking millions of people um, uh, every uh, every year, some smaller or larger events than others. Anyhow, one of the people on the bus said, oh, let's go there. We can at least have darshan. There's a beautiful Hanuman there. And Ramdas is thinking, shit, I want to go and take it easy in Delhi. And this, this, the other, they sort of, you know, it was his deal. It was his bus. So he had arranged the trip and uh, everyone was looking to him to make the decision. So he kept thinking, Darshan over there by the river, ice cream in Delhi. And he went back and forth about it. It took him a while. And finally, okay, let's go at the last minute. And off they went. And sure enough, right in front of this Hanuman temple, out of the blue appears Maharaji with a, a great devotee named Dada Mukherjee. And everyone got off the bus and went nuts. Because up to that point, and this was late 1970, I believe, into the turn of 71, maybe early 71, 
um, when everybody, including myself, had gotten to India and kind of followed Ramdas there and were trying to see Maharaji, a few people had, but then he disappeared. So this was a big deal. Anyhow, the moral or point of the story is that Maharaji said, follow me, and they went over and there was like, you know, 20 odd people, 25 people or something on the bus. And they get to Dada's house and they find out then that Maharaji had gotten everyone up like very five, six in the morning and said, prepare a meal. We're going to have guests. It was 27 people coming and we, for lunch and we're going to feed them. And so, of course, when Ram Das heard this and everybody heard this, it was like, who's making the decision? We made a decision not to go to Delhi. So it's, again, do the laws of the universe work the way we think they do? Or is there something else going on which allows for this sort of event, which, you know, certainly not commonplace, or the event of Maharaji appearing hundreds of miles away to help out an old man who was missing his son? I mean food for thought. So here is Ramdas here and now. Ramdas was born in 1931 as Richard Alpert. In 1967 he traveled to India where he met his spiritual leader Neem Karoli Baba. Under his guru's guidance he studied yoga and meditation and received the name Ram Das, which means servant of God. Ram Das is co-founder and board member of the Seva Foundation, a without-profit organization dedicated to manifesting compassionate action to alleviate suffering in the world community. Ram Das received a master's degree from Wesleyan College and a doctorate from Stanford University. He taught psychology at Stanford and the University of California and taught and conducted research in the Department of Social Relations and the Graduate School of Education at Harvard University between 1958 and 1963. While at Harvard, Ram Das did extensive research with psilocybin, LSD-25, and other psychedelic chemicals. Because of the controversial nature of this research, he was dismissed from Harvard in 1963, the first professor to be fired by Harvard in the 20th century. And now, Ram Das. Since there's no title for this morning, uh, I feel free to play a little more and be a little less didactic and also to open myself to more questions from you but one of the things that has not uh, I haven't had a chance to talk to uh, talk about it all this week was a little something about um, what what India was about for me and um, but a specific aspect of it about what I learned about the potential of human beings. And I want to tell you a series of stories that um, stretched my consciousness quite a bit. Um, I've written a book about a thousand stories of this that are like this. Uh, I won't tell you all of them today. But um, I'll just tell them as, as few of them as directly as I can. Uh, let me just put it in context that I went to India in 1967. And I went there because um, I had spent uh, six years experimenting with psychedelic chemicals in terms of how I could alter my consciousness and realize the potential of my uh, capacities to uh, live on many planes of consciousness simultaneously to um, arrive at, at uh, aspects of being that in East are called liberation or enlightenment uh, to become free and I'll talk about that a little later on if you like what the meaning of free is uh, and by 1967, after many hundreds of experiments with psychedelics, I realized that it, I didn't know enough to use these in a way that was 
um, I couldn't stabilize what I was experiencing. I would go up and come down all the time. And in the course of that, those years, uh, through many friends, uh, Alan Watts and Aldous Huxley and people like that, Gerald Hurd, I had come to recognize all these maps in India that described um, consciousness. And um, so I had gone to India in the hopes of finding somebody who could read those maps. Uh, and I did find uh, such a being who became what I call my guru. And we, that's a special word that has a funny meaning and it's not very well understood in the West. And what I came to have was a very healthy respect for the fact that most of us in the West are functioning on about 10 or 20 percent of our potential, intellectual potential, and our capacities as human beings. Um, so let me just explore with you a couple of stories. I came back to India in 1971 to see my guru again, and um, I couldn't find him. He's a, uh, he was a very uh, free spirit in the external sense as well. He'd disappear into the jungle. He was a very simple man. He had a, a, just a blanket and a, a water pot, really. I mean, he had no money and he didn't care. And People kept trying to s get him to stay in one place, but he wouldn't... Uh... Here we go again. That can't be CW. I was just at his class. <laughs> So, um, finally, uh, I couldn't find him because he wasn't at the places I looked for him. So I knew that when it was time to find him, he'd find me or we'd find each other. India's a big place. So I went to a meditation course with a number of friends, and for about 40 days, we meditated. And at the end of that time, I had gotten a little uh, dry, and I wanted to go to... Uh, I was in um, Bodh Gaya, which is where the Buddha got enlightened. And um, so I wanted to go to Bodh Gaya. I was at Bodh Gaya meditating, and I wanted to leave to go to Delhi, where there was going to be a celebration. So there were about... Uh, I told medit fellow meditators I was going to go, and a number of others said they'd like to join me. And one of the women in the group had come over from England with a, a bus driver in a big bus, an English bus, and he wanted to join us, and he brought his bus. So there were then 33 of us, actually 32 in the bus driver, 33 of us. And um, we left Bodh Gaya for New Delhi. It's about a two-day drive, or a day and a half, two-day drive. And we planned to go halfway and spend the night. In the course of the trip, we would pass through Allahabad. Allahabad is um, one of the very sacred cities in India. It's a place where several rivers come together, the, um, the uh, Ganges and the Yumna. And then there's a spiritual river that comes up from below. And right at the place where those rivers come together, the conjunction, which is called the Prayag, is a, uh, one of the most sacred spaces in India spiritually, and it's a place where on uh, certain planetary moments, which happen every 12 years, uh, there is a, a very auspicious moment from the Hindu point of view to bathe at that particular point. And what happens is about five million people come to bathe at that point, at that moment. And uh, it's a little chaotic and... Uh, <laughs> Last time, about 500 people got trampled to death, but it's quite an ecstatic way to go. I mean, if you're going to go because you're in search of that moment of enlightenment. So, uh, and they camp out for about three months. They come from the mountains. All these wild-looking sadhus come who have wild hair, and they live in ashes, and they're, a lot of the naked babas, the naga babas come. And it's quite an experience to be there. Uh, I've been to several of these. And... Um, so, as we were driving the bus from Bodh Gaya to Delhi, we passed by Allahabad. And one of the fellows who uh, was on the bus, who is now a, uh, an editor of the New York Times, uh, but at that time he was a hippie, um, he said, he came up to me and he said, um, uh, I was at the Mela, which just was over about uh, two or three weeks ago, he said, I went to the Mela, and he said, it's a, a very powerful place. 
And he said, don't you think we ought to just drive over, because it'll take about 10 minutes to drive the bus over to that place. Don't you think we ought to take the 10 minutes and go over there and uh, see the place? And I thought, well, it's late in the day, and we want to go to the hotel. We're tired. And it, after all, if the mela isn't there anymore, it'll just be a big, empty, sandy campground. And uh, that doesn't seem very attractive. So I said, well, I didn't think we would do that. So he said, okay. And he went back to sit down, and I was sitting there in the bus as it was going along, and I was thinking to myself, what kind of a person am I? Here I come to India. I'm within 10 minutes of the most, one of the most sacred places in India, and I'm too busy getting to the hotel to go to this place. That doesn't feel very good. And so I sort of debated with myself, should I do it or not? Because I was the elder, and so I was the leader of the group. So finally I thought, well, why not? Come on, it's a few minutes, we'll watch the sunset and then go home. So I went up to the bus driver, I said, would you turn right up here and we'll go over to the Mela grounds and we will just uh, enjoy the sunset together. He said, fine, he turned right. At that point, Danny came up again to the front of the bus. He said, I see you going over there. I said, yes, and the bus driver drove to this great big empty field. I mean, it was huge because, I mean, you know, millions of people would come there. It was like a carnival ground after the carnival leaves. Papers in the dust rolling, that quality. Few people here and there, but very spread out. And the bus driver said, where shall I park? And Danny said, well, he said, you remember I brought you back those little, um, he brought us all back these little medallions of Hanuman, the monkey. Uh, there's Hanuman, the monkey, by the way. Um, and he said, I, uh, I brought you back those, and I bought them from a stand right there near that uh, temple, that Hanuman temple that's, that's over there in the corner. So why don't we park there? So the bus driver goes to pull up there. And as the bus is stopping, one of the fellows looks over and he says, there's Maharaji. Maharaji being a name meaning great king, but it's also, and it's all a very common name. It's just a name of respect and it's used for many, many thousands of people. A sweeper could be called Maharaji. In this case, he was talking about my guru. He said, there's Maharaji. And as the bus stopped, Maharaji and one of his Indian devotees walked right by the bus. Okay. Now, I hadn't seen him in two years, and um, he pulled right by the bus, and I got quite emotional. We all got off the bus. Most of those people had never met him, and I ran up, and I touched his feet, and I was uh, very emotional, and all these people stood around, and he looked uh, kind of bored, and then he said, um, he said, follow, follow us, and so... He and the Indian devotee got onto a rickshaw, a bicycle rickshaw, and they started down the street, and we got into this huge bus and started to follow them. And then we went into a smaller and smaller street, and then we came to a little house, and they got out of the rickshaw and walked into the house. And I got down from the bus, and all the people got down from the bus, and we started to go up on the porch, and were met by these Indian people that said, welcome. And I smelled this incredible smell of Indian food. And uh, it was about 5 in the afternoon, 5.30 in the afternoon. And the man said to me, we've been waiting for you. He said, this morning at 7 o'clock, Maharaji said, start cooking. There'll be 33 people here for dinner. Okay, that was a stray. And the entire meal was sitting there waiting for 33 people. There were 32 people plus the bus driver. Right. Now, I just ask you, who was it that was sitting in the bus thinking that he was making the choice? Do you hear the predicament? If indeed I thought I was sitting deciding whether we would go there, how could that have been? if already the whole thing was written out. Now, what does that do to my consciousness about whether or not I'm making the decisions I think I'm making? I just want to stretch you a little bit by playing with these kinds of questions. Um, I'll tell you a few more just to...
One of my friends, um, who's now, who started the Seva Foundation, he's a doctor and epidemiologist. He was a professor of public health at the University of Michigan. Uh, when he was a doctor, he came to India. And um, he was, at that time, also a hippie. I'm, you know, I'm kind of taking you back into a certain historical time when that, was, that term was acceptable. Um, and his wife brought him to meet uh, Maharaji. And when Maharaji met him, Maharaji, at, right after he met him, said, uh, Maharaji was always very cryptic, and Maharaji said, you and no doctor. So what Larry heard was, you are no doctor, which is what his mother had been saying to him for years, because here he had gone into medical school and he wasn't earning a living. And so for, uh, you know, uh, so Maharaji kept saying, you and no doctor, you and no doctor, you and no doctor. And finally, um, Larry realized that he was saying UNO doctor, United Nations doctor. And then Maharaji said, go, go. So Larry went to um, Delhi to uh, become a UNO doctor. Now he's a uh, long haired, long beard, white Indian clothes. He walks into the United Nations uh, Health WHO. They take one look, they obviously don't want this. Uh, and he says, I've come to sign up as a doctor because they were doing a smallpox eradication. Uh, as many of you know, smallpox is the only human disease that has been eradicated from the face of the earth. And it took 35 nations and 5 billion house calls to do it. But they did it because it was spread from human to human and they found the last cases and they vaccinated everybody around it and then no more. So. All the older people in this group are all vaccinated. All the younger people aren't. You don't have to be. You don't have to carry vaccination cards. And that was because a whole group of people got together from all different countries and they, they did this like a, a tremendous battle and they ended up vaccinating millions of people and got rid of it. So this was the program the WHO was leading at that time. And so Larry signed up and they said, we'll let you, don't call us, we'll call you. So Larry went and he went back up on the bus, which was an eight hour bus trip with no springs in the bus, back up to, from Delhi up to uh, Nanital, where our, one of the, where we were hanging out. And he walks in and Maharaji says, Kya, what, what's going on? And he says, they don't want me. And Maharaji says, you went out, doctor, go. So Larry says, look, he's the guy, boss, you know, so he gets back on the bus, he goes to Delhi. And this time he sort of puts on a regular Western shirt and he goes in and they turn him down again. And he comes back up and this goes on, I don't know, six times, I think, back and forth and back and forth. And they just don't want him. By then he's cut his beard. He's got a necktie. He's slowly getting himself together. Finally, I think, I don't remember whether it was the seventh or eighth time he came to them and he said, and they got to know him after a while. He said, look, he said, this guru is bugging me. Would you give me any job at all? I don't even care if I'm a doctor. I just got to have something to get him off my back. They said, well, we need an administrator uh, in the southern part. Of it. He says, I'll take it. So they said, fine, we'll give it to you as soon as you get. Um, we just have to get one more thing is security clearance from the United States government. And he said, uh oh, we're going to have a little problem with that because he had been a very politically uh, um, radical doctor uh, in Berkeley during the Berkeley time and um, so he knew the, uh, the FBI had a long file on him and CIA so he thought well that isn't going to work so he went back up to the mountain and he said Maharaji uh, they say that uh, they have to get security clearance and there's no way I'm going to get security clearance so Maharaji looks at him and he says who gives security clearance so Larry had no idea. So he thought of who's the head of the program, He's, uh, who was a man named D.A. Henderson. He said, uh, Dr. Henderson. So Maharaji, in this kind of real showbiz way, goes under his blanket, and he comes up and he says, how do you spell it? So Maharaji, Larry says, H-E-N-D, Mar Maharaji is under there going, H E. N D E R S O N. Ciao, go to Delhi. You and O doctor. 
if you do time exchange, at that moment, there was a cocktail party going on in Geneva, Switzerland. And the Surgeon General of the United States was at the WHO headquarters at a cocktail party with D.A. Henderson. And the Surgeon General said to D.A. Henderson, how is the program going on smallpox? And he says, well, the Russians are doing this, and the Swiss are doing this, and the French are doing this. Well, what about us? Well, we've been trying to bring in some labor, but we haven't been too... So we've got some young doctor we're trying to bring in, and uh, we've got to get security clearance for him. So the Surgeon General says, well, who gives that? So Henderson said, I think you do. So he says, I do? He says, you got it. what's the guy's name? His name is Brilliant, Larry Brilliant. Hey, give me a cocktail number. And he writes on a cocktail napkin, give Larry Brilliant clearance. And he signs his name and hands it to D.A. Henderson. This was happening H-E-N-D-E-R, right at that moment. Now, you can say, well, what an interesting coincidence. Or you can start to play with the edge of that as to whether or not the laws of the universe work the way you think they do. Because when you live in that world, at first you say, oh, those are all miracles, which is a way of rejecting them with your mind. But if you allow the possibility that all of these things are I was with a Swami who I traveled around India with at one point. He was a very powerful man. And at one point, when we were at a little village, he woke me up at around three in the morning, grabbed me by the hand. We didn't speak the same language. He spoke Tamil. And we, he took me down a little street and up to a little temple up on the top of the town. And he sat me down. It was around three or four in the morning. And he whispered a mantra, a phrase, into my ear. And he started to do something of over me, and I went unconscious. The next thing I knew, it was around nine in the morning, and people were shaking me, and they were saying, uh, uh, Baba wants to see you, Swami. The Swami wanted to see me. I didn't know what had happened to me. So I came back to where he was, and he said, um, I said, what was that all about? He said, that is a mantra that will give you vast wealth and vast power. Now, I wanted vast wealth and vast power, but I didn't want to want it. So I said, I only want vast wealth and vast power if you'll give me an equal amount of love and compassion. And he said, with look of disgust, just do the mantra. You know, don't come on to me, just do the mantra. So I couldn't stop doing the mantra. I mean, I was doing it day and night. And we were traveling through southern India, and I was doing the mantra with beads. And We finally came to his temple in um, Ganesh Puri, near Bombay. And he said, I don't want you meditating with the other people. I want you meditating in this small inner room of the meditation hall, an old room. So at two in the morning, I went down there to meditate, and there was a man with a big key that unlocked the door, and he let me in. It was about... A hundred degrees in there, pitch black. So I took off my clothes, I was so hot, and I lay down on the floor doing the mantra. And the minute I lay down on the floor doing the mantra, I was, it felt like I was being pulled out of my body, just like ripped out of my body. And I found myself in some place, in a doorway to a room, and I looked in the room, and there was this Swami. And he was sitting on a bed, and I walked in, and I honored him. And as I honored him, I started to lift up. Now, you could say this is a dream or a vision or whatever, except I seemed to be quite conscious. I started to lift up over him till I was looking down on him, and I thought to myself, I'm flying. Interesting. Then I thought, where will I go? And at that moment, my body tilted a little bit. And I went to right myself, and it brought me out of that trance, and I suddenly found myself back in this room in the, in the meditation temple at two in the, two, about two, 10 in the morning. Are you, can you hear the story? This one? Is it too confusing? And I was so agitated from this thing that had happened to me 
that I shook the door and the guy came with a big key and he unlocked it because I just couldn't stay in there anymore. And I walked outside into the moonlight and there was the Swami and one of his Indian devotees who spoke English walking around the courtyard and I walked up to him and I honored him and he looked at me and he said, how did you like flying? Okay. You hear that one? In other words, well, you, you hear it. I'm not going to belabor it. Um, I'll give you I'll give you just one more and then maybe we'll just see if we can reflect about it a little bit and then uh, go where you'd like to go later about meditation um, this uh, concerned a very very famous saint in India named Ramana Maharshi and it was told to me by a um, a uh, major in the Air Force, in the Indian Air Force, who as a child had grown up around this saint. And uh, this is the story. Um, there was a, an English executive who had plants in India. And um, he, the English executive was very agitated. And his plant manager in Madras said, why don't you come to India because there is a very great saint a few miles out of Madras, this Ramana Maharshi, and maybe he can help you. So um, the Englishman flew to India in his private seaplane, as the story goes. And um, he went to Madras and he was taken to see Ramana Maharshi. And he sat down in the back of the room. Ramana Maharshi was known as the silent saint. He was very quiet. He said very few words. He spoke a little, but very few. And he was just sitting up there. And you just go and you sit in the hall and you start to feel these incredible waves of peace just being around him. The Englishman sat down and after a few minutes, he felt very agitated. And he decided that this was a waste of time. So he stood up and he decided to leave. And as he started to leave, Ramana Maharshi said to him, Sir, before you leave, would you do me one favor? The Englishman said, what is it? He said, would you, uh, could we get some writing paper? Would you please do me the honor? Would you write a note to your wife? Bizarre request. So he writes... He takes the note, he looks very disgusted, he writes and he says, Dear Blanche, I didn't find what I was looking for. I will be home next week. I hope you remember the dentist appointment. Hope you're watering the flowers. My love to you. I think his name is Fred. He finished the note and he looked disgusted and what do you do now? Ramana Maharshi held out his hand. Ramana Maharshi took the note. Ramana Maharshi was a naked saint. Ramana Maharshi folded up the note and stuck it under one part of his behind. And he said to the man, would you now just sit here for just a few minutes more, and then you can leave. The man said, all right. Sat down again. After about three or four minutes, Ramana Maharshi got up and started to shuffle out of the hall. And as he passed the man, he handed him the note back. And the man was totally disgusted. I mean, this was like, what was he trying to do? And the man started to get up and he looked down and he realized that it was not the note that he had given to Ramana Maharshi. And he opened it and it said, Dear Fred, I'm sorry you didn't find what you wanted. Yes, I've watered the law, the flowers, and remember the dentist. I will look for you next week. I would write a longer note, but the dark gentleman in the turban that brought the note is rushing me signed Blanche, right? and it was in his wife's handwriting. Okay. Now, you can do with this information as you will. I just say, doesn't it push your consciousness just a little bit? Doesn't it raise some interesting questions about the nature of phenomena that seem... When Maharaji was young one day, younger, he was having a, a he was at a barbershop, and uh, I said I wouldn't tell any more, but they, they're kind of addictive. 
And his, uh, in, in India, when you get, go to a barber, you actually squat on the street, and the barber squats there, and you, he shaves you, and you're just all squatting there on the street. And so he lathered up Maharaji's face, and he was an old man, and a barber, and uh, as he was shaving Maharaji, he started to complain that he had only one son, and the son had gone away ten years ago, and he didn't know where the son was, and he hoped the son would come back, but he wasn't sure he ever would, and he needed him because he was getting old. And he was moaning and moaning, and he had shaved half of Maharaji's face, and Maharaji says, wait a second, I have to go out and pee. Maharaji got up and went behind the back of a building. A couple of minutes came back, sat down, the barber finished shaving him. Maharaji got up to go, and he said, if it's God's will, maybe your son will come. The next day, the son arrived, this is after ten years. The barber said to him, what are you doing here? The son says, I don't know what I'm doing here. He said, I, I work as a manager of a hotel in a town that was about 150 miles away. He said, yesterday, he said, I was at the desk of the hotel and this man rushed in with shaving cream on one half of his face and he said, your father needs you, go right away, hurry. And he ran out again. I only have um, 996 more of these to go. Just see if there's any more you need to hear to... Let me just, before we go on to something else, ask you, what do you make of all that? What do you do about that? Does it just seem quaint, or does it provoke you, or what do you do? Does your world include that possibility? How does it affect your life? Yeah. 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 I tried to figure out how Maharaji was doing what he was doing. And it had to do with that, that as your awareness moves out of a time-space locus of your body, your awareness starts to not be dominated by time and space, and then you are wherever you are. And uh, uh, when I, um, I went to, um, I think I told some of you the story, but I went, after I was in India for three or four months, I went to Delhi to get my visa uh, renewed, and um, I was at that time very much a yogi with my beard, and I was wearing what's called an alfi, which is like a potato sack, and I was barefoot, and I had lots of beads, and I had been doing yoga for four or five hours a day, breathing exercises, and the light, it looked like I was a coal miner, it had a tor there was this brightness in my head, and I was like, zap, and I was walking around Kanot Circus in New Delhi, and I needed some stationery, and I went into a stationery store, and uh, I was just going to be in Delhi for the day, and um, it was eight hours down on the bus, and I walked around, walked barefoot in the store, and I said I needed some envelopes, and I got the envelopes, and I went to pay the man, and he wouldn't take my money. I mean, whatever I was projecting was so powerful, and, you know, he wouldn't take the money. So I went to a vegetarian restaurant, and I was kind of full of myself as, boy, I'm a pretty good yogi, you know. I mean, I got free envelopes. I mean, I didn't think of it quite that way, but it was sort of, it had a little of that edge to it. And uh, so I went to a vegetarian restaurant, and everybody was watching me, because to see a Westerner come in with all the regalia of yogi hood on, and uh, an older person, and so on, and uh, I sat down, and they served me a vegetable tali, a vegetable plate, and I ate it, and it, I prayed first, and I did it, and they were watching every move, and I was feeling very yogi-like. And then they brought me ice cream with two uh, cream biscuits. And I took a look at those biscuits, and all of my childhood sugar addiction came up, but I knew that wasn't yogi food. I, yogis just don't eat those biscuits. But I really wanted those biscuits, but they were all watching me. So I was in this funny predicament. So I, I started to sort of look wholly in this direction and move the plate over it. There was a wall right here. I moved it over to the corner. And then when I had it over in the corner, 
while I was looking holy, I took the biscuits and I took them down this way, and then I looked like I was praying. I mean, it was really fraudulent. I was, I was praying, and I got the biscuits into my mouth, and I ate these two sugar biscuits. I left the restaurant, went out, got on the bus, back up into this very remote village, no telephones, no nothing. And I, the next morning, I go to see my guru, and I walk in, kneel down in front of Maharaji. He grabs my hair, pulls it back, pulls on my beard, and he says to me, how did you like the biscuits? Where was he? How did he know that? How did he catch that place in my mind? How did he do that? He kept doing that to me again and again and again. And after a while, I realized there was nowhere I could go to hide from him. I mean, I couldn't go in the bathroom and close the door and have secret thoughts anymore. It was nowhere. It was like he was there. He was there all the time with me. And once I realized that, and he said, I'll always be in communion with you. Even though he died in 73, it didn't change anything. I still feel he's like there in my life. We all do have guides. We all do have some inner guide, some guidance. The guidance can come in the form of an external form, like a guru. It can come in an internal form, like your own inner voice, or it can come in the terms of some kind of spiritual entity that's on another plane. And uh, I feel that he's a continuing guide for me. I feel he continually uh, is presenting me. See, when you're my method, my spiritual method, one of my methods is what's called Guru Kripa, or the grace of the Guru. And it involves the dialogue with the Guru. And at that point, everything in your life becomes part of that dialogue. Since he played with me so much, I'm assuming now that he's just playing with me. And I'm working with my life to, to play with that process until I cultivate those qualities of compassion, of love, of joy, of emptiness, of things like that. That's that right. That's you know. Well, let me talk just for a moment about um, about what meditation is about. For we'll start back a little bit at the beginning. Um, let's take the turning right story and going to and Maharaji having the food ready. What that suggested to me was that who I thought I was that was sitting in the bus that was thinking I was turning right and making the decision was indeed. I was not free at that moment to make the decision. That was a programmed thing in me. Now, most of us, when you ask the question, do you have free will? Most people think that they do have free will. They think they make choices. Like you had a series of choices of what, what program to come to here or to whether to come to the university. And you think you made that choice. And you think you had a choice to make that choice. But you are also very sophisticated people, and you know that if you study any part of the way of forms, like if you study physics, or you study chemistry, or you study anthropology, or you study astronomy, you will see that forms are lawfully related to other forms. You see, wherever you look, you see law in the universe. And when you're a psychologist and a cognitive psychologist as I am and you study the mind, you begin to see that there are laws of thought as well. And that you don't make a decision out of a vacuum. You make a decision out of things that you learned as a child, 
out of situational things that present themselves. And while it's too complicated to do a factor analytic study where you can say it's these factors that determine that thought, when you say, I think I'll go to the movies, if I could stand back far enough and could see all of the lawful processes that went into your mind, I could say now what he or she is going to say is, I think I'll go to the movies. Do you, you hear that? What I'm saying is that your thought processes, which you think are free, are in fact not free. They are part of a lawful unfolding. Now that's very disconcerting to people who think they are making choices all the time. Because what that suggests is you are under the illusion. The thought that I am free is just a thought, and it itself is part of a programmed way of being. Then the question is, if that is true, what is free in you? And the I always wanted to use one of these things. It shows you a real lecture. <laughs> So, here at the, at the level of thought, these are all, this is like a river of thoughts going by, and they are all lawful, lawfully related. Two wills? Lawfully related. So then the question is, what's free? And it turns out, when you go into... Um, very, very um, extensive study of the way the mind works, not from Western psychology point of view, but from Buddhist uh, psychology, you see that there is something called awareness. This is just a label. I mean, there are a lot of other names for it. Awareness, which becomes aware of thoughts, and the, while these thoughts are going forth lawfully, the only thing that is free is this awareness which stands behind the thoughts. Now, um, awareness could be like the flashlight that is shining on different things, so that if you're sitting here at this moment and you become aware of the sunshine, you became your awareness focused on your eyes seeing the sunshine. And then you become aware of the seat under your behind and your awareness moved to the sense of the pressure on your uh, skin. Now. Uh, the awareness focuses on one thing after another. And these thoughts and sensations keep coming up at a very fast rate. So if you're sitting here feeling now, you at one moment will feel the earth under your, the ground under your feet. Then you hear my voice through your ears. And you all have had the experience where you're sitting reading something and you get so intensely involved in the reading that somebody walks into the room and you don't even notice they walked in. Now, you weren't holding your ears. Your auditory canals and the whole auditory nervous system were working fine. And the minute you got disrupted from your visual and thought processes, you were aware somebody was in the room. But that, that awareness, didn't, you didn't notice it because you were so focused on your eyes seeing. And so the awareness moves from one, what's called, sense door to another, which is seeing, touching, smelling, tasting, uh, feeling. And then the last one is thinking, which is another inner set of phenomena. So when you begin to see this river that's made up of thoughts and sensations going by you, and it, it goes on, like you wake up in the morning, and you start, you're lying in bed, and the first thing as you come back into normal waking consciousness, you think, uh, I've got to go to the toilet. I smell coffee. I'm hungry. I've got to make that call today. I'm tired. It's warm in the corner of the bed. I could sleep ten more minutes. And your mind starts a whole brrrr of thoughts, and you're going from, your awareness is going from thought to thought to thought to thought, and then finally, at the end of the day, you're exhausted and you stop thinking, you go back to sleep. This podcast has been brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate all the support for the Foundation and for Ramdas's work, and we hope that you will continue that support. You can go to Ramdas.org and click on the Donate Now button and follow the prompts. Thank you.